God is actually preparing us for uh, something supernatural, and that's going to be the best, the best times of our lives. Our best days are ahead of us. They're not behind us. <clears throat> now, nostalgia can be kind of tempting sometimes for us to think back about some, some pleasant thing from the past and... Um, but you know, um, the past always, we always see the past through rose-colored lenses. Because when we were there, we didn't think that was the best of times. You know, we, when we were there 30 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever it was, we didn't think that everything was so great. We were always looking forward to something better in the future. And now we're there. But you know, that's the thing that God does. He always leads us upward. You know, he, he never says, well, you've gone too far. You know, you, you, you just might as well lay down and quit. He never does that. So, so there, are, there are great things ahead. There, there's plenty to look forward to. And, and we need to keep that in mind. So Father, I thank you that as we study your word today, that, that you will will give us that sense of hopeful expectation for what you have in store for us, that, that you have good things, uh, that you have our well-being always in mind before you. And, and I thank you, Father, that, that your spirit gives us comfort and gives us hope and assurance and, and um, perseverance to, to uh, pursue the, the course that you lay before us. And each one of us has our our load that we have to carry, and I thank you, Father, for your help in that for each, each person here in Jesus' name. Amen. We started a series of messages on Wednesday night called The School of Prayer, and this is going to be the second message out of that, and the title this morning is When Prayer Isn't Easy. Okay, and, uh, you know, one might ask, well, when is prayer ever easy? Well, um, we're going to talk about that a little bit because um, there are good times and there are bad times, of course. There's some times where, where our prayers are, are, are more along the, the line of, of praise of God for, for what he has done and, and that hopeful expectation that I spoke of a minute ago that he gives you that. And, and so it's, oh God, thank you. But then there's times where, uh, you know, it's a hard road to hoe. And, and uh, sometimes we just feel like that we, we can't even go on uh, dealing with whatever it is we're trying to deal with. <clears throat> and God meets us there. Uh, go to Luke chapter 18. These messages are not so much about the technicalities of prayer. There, there are those, and, and it speaks of them in, in certain places in the New Testament where Paul describes uh, petition and supplication and so forth. And we may get around to, to talking about those in another message. But here in Luke chapter 18, the first verse really kind of tells it all right here. It says that Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray. So we're always to pray. So that we're talking about prayer for every occasion, every situation, every place that we find ourselves in life. We should be praying. Always to pray and not to turn coward and faint or lose heart or give up. Well, sometimes life throws some things in our path that make us want to do just that. And so this parable is to encourage us not to give up. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither reverenced and feared God nor respected or considered men. Well, that sounds kind of like the judicial system we have today, doesn't it? Uh, anyway... Um, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, 
protect and defend and give me justice against my adversary. The word adversary actually means an, an opponent in a lawsuit. So if there is a lawsuit of some kind against us, then the one who's on the opposite side that you're on is your adversary. And we know in the general overall sense who our adversary is. It's Satan, right? Because he brings charges against us day and night before God. Okay, and so let's keep that in mind as we go forward here. And verse 4, And for a time the judge would not give her help. <clears throat> but later he said to himself, Though I have neither reverence or fear for God or respect or consideration for men, yet because this widow continues to bother me, I will defend and protect and avenge her lest she give me intolerable annoyance and wear me out by her continual coming, and at the last she come and rail on me or assault me or strangle me. Well, that, she must have really been pestering that guy. <laughs> if he was afraid, she was going to come and strangle him. Give me justice! Right? And then the Lord, then Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not our just God defend and protect and avenge his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he defer them or delay help on their behalf? I tell you, he will defend and protect and avenge them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistence in faith on the earth? <clears throat> the implication there is that the, uh, the last days, um, the days when, during which Jesus is finally going to come back, are going to be such that people will have given up and turned coward and lost heart. You know, that fear is, a, is an insidious thing. And this is what... The, uh, the people who are getting their orders from Satan uh, running this world, that's their big, uh, that's their bomb. That's their atomic weapon is to promote fear. That's how they turned our American Republic into a socialist country in five months by promoting fear of, of a disease. That, and there have been diseases that have killed a lot more people than this coronavirus has that every year run through the land. And they, you know the, about the most fear they ever tell you is, well, go down to the drugstore and get a flu shot. You know, but, but this, they got the whole population in fear that if they go outside, especially if they go outside without a mask on, that they're going to get this virus and it's going to kill them. And they promoted that uh, constantly. And so the whole population, by and large, uh, got into fear. And that's not the only fear that the devil has to promote to people. I mean, there's, there's now fear that, um, you know, depending on which, you know, demographic group you're in, fear that the police are going to come and, and, and beat you on the street, or, or fear that somebody who looks different than you is going to riot and burn your city down. And uh, yes, and both of those things have happened. Uh, and then there's fear that something from the sky is going to fall and, and, and it's going to, uh, you know, destroy cities or it's going to make the uh, tsunami in the ocean. And uh, the Bible does talk about that in the book of Revelation. So there's all these fears. And that's why Jesus is saying that, um, you know, in the, in the last days that there's not going to be a lot of faith. We'll see fear works in uh, opposition to faith. Fear cancels faith out. You know, it, it's like they're 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 like if you had two chemicals that that were opposite, uh, you throw them together, like like vinegar and baking soda or something like that. And what do you do when you throw those two things together? Well, you get a lot of bubbles, <laughs> right? Well, we're getting a lot of bubbles in our world today. But let's keep reading here, because. 
he actually doesn't change the subject uh, starting in verse 9. I, I always looked at verse 9 through 14 as if he wasn't really talking about prayer anymore. He was talking about humility. Well, he is talking about humility, but he's still talking about people who are praying. You see this? And Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves. Well, you know what? Trust is, a, is an element of prayer. And so you can pray to yourself. I'm not recommending that you do that now, but you can pray to yourself. I mean, okay, every one of us does self-talk every now and then, don't we? You know, sometimes like, come on, body, get out of bed. It, the alarm clock went off. And it's like, oh, oh, you know, it's just 20 steps to the kitchen and then you can have a cup of coffee. Okay, that's self-talk, right? That's not necessarily the Holy Spirit telling you that. That's you telling yourself that, okay? But carry that to an extreme and you can, you can be telling yourself, you know, this is, this is the counterfeit to faith in God it is self-help. And, and the, the world is full of self-help methods, self-help manuals. You know, psychology teaches you how to, how to, to talk yourself, how to psych yourself into being a winner or whatever it is, okay? Well, that's trusting in yourself. And this is exactly what Jesus is referring to here. Those who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous... That means, hey, I'm right. Uh, uh, you know, and here again, uh, there's a lot of this in this world now. You know, if you're a conservative, you think you're right. And if you're a liberal, you think you're right. And, and it's like both sides have an equal uh, degree of self-righteousness. Right? That's what he's talking about. Okay? And that they... They were confident that they were right and they scorned and made nothing of all the rest of all men. You know, that's what you will do. If you think you, will, you are right, then those that disagree with you, then they're, they're just piddly. You know, they're, they're, they're just useless eaters. We, we just need to get rid of them, right? Now, let me say, we've got to be careful as Christians that we don't start thinking that well, those, you know, those, those drug dealers and those prostitutes and those, those people, you know, uh, are, are, you know, the, 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 the wealthy who are living the, the great lifestyle and they're not serving God, the ones you see on TV after the news, right? Uh, that, well, they, we, we need to rid the world of all of them. You know, God loves them too. God loves all of us, right? So we should not uh, scorn or make nothing of anybody. Just saying. Okay, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. See, he's still talking about prayer. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously. <clears throat> this, is, this is key to understanding the difference between these two people. <clears throat> the Pharisee he, he made a big show of his prayer. Uh, he was not quiet about it, and he was wanting to make sure other people saw that he was praying. You know, he was doing this to be seen by others. And he prayed thus before and with himself. See, this is an example of what I talked about, about praying to yourself. He was talking to himself. If we were to describe this in, in Freudian psychology terms, it was his super ego talking to his ego, right? And, and he, he was saying, yeah, dude, you're, you're great. Um, the Pharisee said to himself, God, see, if, if you are in self-righteousness, then uh, you're an idolater because you're making a God of yourself, See, he thinks he's talking to God, but it's really part of him talking to another part of him. God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, extortioners, robbers, swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life, adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. 
<clears throat> no, now let me tell you. It's, it's hard for us Christians not to, to kind of look at a lot of what's going on around in the, in the world today and think, now that's wrong and that's bad and it's, it's really, it's leading people down the wrong course. It, it, it's, it's not, that's not unthinkable that we would look at a lot of what goes in the world and say, hey, we can do better than that. Okay, that, that's all right. I mean, <clears throat> it's all right up to a point. But when you see a, an individual person, you see some guy begging for money on, on, at the street corner, and you say, well, that guy, he's a loser. He needs to live like I'm living, and he wouldn't be out there on the street begging for money. Then you've crossed that line. And this Pharisee crossed that line. I mean, he didn't know he was crossing the line, but he did. He, he saw this tax collector over here who was praying. How do you know that, that that beggar on the street corner isn't praying, God, give me, give me some more money so I can, or whatever he's going to do with it. I mean, he might even be buying heroin with it. But he might be crying out to God saying, God, give me another day. Let me live one more day. We don't know what's going on inside that guy. And just like the Pharisee didn't know what was going on inside this tax collector, but he was putting himself in a superior position to that guy. And, here, and he goes on to prove it to himself why he's superior to that guy. He says, well, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I gain. But the tax collector, merely standing at a distance, would not even lift up his eyes toward heaven, but kept striking his breast saying, oh God, be favorable, be merciful to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. Now, there's something here that we need to understand because what this guy is doing uh, it give, teaches us something. Keep the place here and go to the 130th Psalm because sooner or later, we will all find ourselves in that place where this tax collector is where we don't even feel like we can look up toward God, that we feel like we have messed up so badly or that, that we are just such a failure that, that God's going to, he's, he's done with you, you know, it, that you can feel like that. Now, I pray that you don't, but sometimes the devil can, can push you to that place. And he's pushing all humanity to that place right now. And when you're at that place, then you're not wanting to put your Christianity on display, are you? You know, you're, if, if you're praying to God at all, you're, you're doing it out where nobody can see you because you're ashamed to even come to the assembly and, and pray, all right? Well, Psalm 130, the psalmist uh, has been there. He describes this. Psalm 130, out of the depths... I have cried to you, O oh Lord. The depths, I mean, this, if this guy's not just that he's in a corner in the temple instead of right out in the middle where everybody can see him. I mean, he's in the bottom of the ocean. I mean, this is probably what Jonah was praying when he was in the belly of the fish. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O oh Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to the voice of my supplication. See, that is an example right there of what uh, that widow was doing, crying out, you know, what, was, was like, God, help! If you, Lord, should keep account of and treat us according to our sins, O Lord, who could stand? See, this is important because the devil likes to compare you to other people just like that Pharisee likes to compare himself. The devil always wants to point out somebody that seems to be living a real spiritual life saying, well, now God blesses them, but you're not like them, so God's not going to bless you. Well, this contradicts that. This says there is nobody that can stand before God and say, hey, I am righteous. And God gets his little black book out and says, well, what about this, right? Just like Jesus did with those Pharisees that wanted to stone the woman in adultery, right? Okay, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, just what man needs, that you may be reverently feared and worshipped. 
Keep the place in Psalms and go to 1 Corinthians. Now keep the place in Luke 18 also. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is one we read typically when we uh, observe the Lord's Supper. And certainly it, it is apropos then because that is such a solemn remembrance of what Jesus did in paying for our sins that God wants us to do this, this, this sort of soul searching that we're talking about, that this sort of recognizing our need for God and, and being aware of how we fall short is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, I know that the, uh, the, the charismatic, modern charismatic movement in America kind of tells you, don't do that. You know, that's condemnation. Well, okay, again, you can cross over a line where you're just beating yourself with a ball peen hammer, and no, you don't need to do that. But sometimes there's a comeuppance. Sometimes things rock along, and then you kind of, you stumble. You know, you, you mess up, and it's like, oh, I thought I was doing real good. Now look at this. Well, you know, that, that it, God wants you to see that you have done that. God wants that. God doesn't want you to gloss that over and, oh, pretend, no, that doesn't exist. You know, the blood of Jesus already covers that, and you just go in your merry way. God doesn't want that. And, and I'll tell you, the Scripture says that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. It says, For if we searchingly examine ourselves, detecting our shortcomings and recognizing our own condition, we should not be judged and penalty decreed. But when we do fall short and are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined and chastened so that we may not finally be condemned with the world. He's telling us two things there. First of all, he's saying that the world doesn't do that. You know, if the, wor if, if the world, if somebody goes out and, and uh, you know, robs or, or does something, uh, you know, bad, they justify it and say, well, you know, I deserve this because I had such a bad life. Or, or you know, they, so this person did me wrong, so I, do, I deserve to shoot them in the head, or whatever it is. That they, don't, they don't feel that, that compunction, or at least not right away. And, and God disciplines those he loves. You know, so sometimes that pang of conscience is God's discipline. Now, it takes some spiritual maturity to learn to discern when that's the devil doing that and when it's God doing that. We may talk some more about that in another message. But point being, God disciplines those he loves, and, and he says right here that if, if God points out, well, you know, you're not really measuring up in this area here, that's a good thing. Because you don't want to be failing and think, you know, you don't want to be making an F in, in math and think you're getting an A. You know, if you're, if you're failing math, you need to know so that you can pass, so that you know you've got some kind of number sense. So when you go to the grocery store five years from now, you, you don't end up at the check stand, uh, you know, with twice as much groceries as you got money for. Right? Well, it's the same way with the way we live our lives. God... God doesn't want us to be uh, to have shortcomings and, and, and for our condition to be, we, us think we're doing better than we are. Okay, uh, go back to Luke chapter 18. So the tax collector recognized he wasn't doing very well, but in verse 14, Jesus says, pay attention to this. He says, I tell you, that man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified, forgiven, made upright and in right standing with God. And this was the one saying, oh God, I'm messed up again. And, he, and, and God forgave him and he went down to his house justified rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, you let the place in Luke 18 go and go back to uh, Isaiah chapter 62. It 
See, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes things are so chaotic and so troubled in the world, just like they are right now. Now, as I said, I mean, it wasn't a cakewalk in 1985 either, but, but um, you know, it, it's, it's, we're in a different season now. I know I've talked to you before about Neil Strauss and William Howe's book, The Fourth Turning, and I'm not, not saying that that needs to be put on the same level as, as what God says, but you know, they do recognize something that even Solomon recognized, and that is that there are cycles to history, that there's times for certain things, and what we have, the time we have entered into now is not like the time where most of us came to the Lord back in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, this, this is a critical season. And the word crisis actually is the Greek word for judgment. Right? So we are in a time of judgment. And it's, it's one of the, the, the saddest things that the world, by and large, doesn't know that that's what's going on right now. If they knew that, I think they'd, they'd get with the program. But anyway... Isaiah 62, verse 6. God says, I have set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem, who will never hold their peace day or night. Well, that's an example of that praying always. And in fact, being a watchman implies that you are seeing what's going on out there. You, you know, you're seeing uh, how the, 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 the Luciferians are taking over the world and they're preparing everything for the emergence of the Antichrist and a, a one-world currency and a one-world system. Why do you think that some of these places aren't giving back change anymore when you go to the grocery store? Because they're trying to get everybody weaned from, from paying with money and everything being with plastic, and sooner or later, they'll, it'll be with the chip. All right? So, so this is... If you're, if you're watching, if you're paying attention and you're seeing these things, don't freak out. That means God, you are a watchman. I'm t we're talking to watchmen here. Not every Christian is a watchman, unfortunately. I, I'm not sure why that is, but whatever. If you see the stuff, that means you are a watchman. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray. Night and day, it says, and not hold our peace. You who are his servants and by your prayers put the Lord in remembrance of his promises. Keep not silence and give him no rest. Just like that widow before the unjust judge, right? Give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her a praise in the earth. And let me say, we're not just talking about the nation of Israel when he speaks of Jerusalem. He's talking about God's people, the people where God's presence dwells. Okay? Let me give you some more examples of this persistence in prayer. Go to the book of Genesis. Of course, the classic one <clears throat> is Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 18, the Lord sent down his messengers to warn Abraham of what was of the judgment that was going to come to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I don't think we have to use our imagination too much to see how that might apply to the world today. Uh, anyway, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, The Lord speaking to Abraham said, Because the shriek of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is exceedingly grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether as vilely and wickedly as the cry of it which comes to me. And if not, I will know. Now, the two men who were angels turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came close and said, Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
Suppose there are in the city 50 righteous. Will you destroy the place and not spare it for the sake of 50 righteous in it? <clears throat> Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as do the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth execute judgment and do righteously? See, you know, sometimes we, uh, we look at mm, California, or we look at Seattle or someplace like that, us Bible Belt uh, citizens here, and, and we say, oh, well, God's just going to wipe them all out. You know, they're all wicked. It's going to fall in the ocean. Well, you know what? God's got his people there too. And we need to be praying for those places, especially, especially Portland right now. I, the civil war in America has begun, and it began in Portland, Oregon. It's going on right now. The, uh, the protesters have fired explosives against the federal building. Now, you know, in, in 1861, when, uh, when the, uh, the, the rebels of the South fired against Fort Sumter, that began a civil war. Now, I don't know. They, they will do this one differently than the one that they did in the 1860s. But that's what is, that's what is looming in our future. You know, I'm not, this is not just my opinion. That this is, you know, the, the watchmen uh, throughout the body of Christ in America have been warning about this for decades, for years, and it's happening. It's happening now. Don't shut your eyes to it. Anyway, um, so Abraham here, he's saying, God, um, if, there's, if there's righteous people in Sodom, you're not going to destroy Sodom. And... Uh, in verse 26, and the Lord said, well, yeah, if I find in the city of Sodom 50 righteous, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And then he goes on down, and finally down in verse 30, then Abraham said to him, oh, let not the Lord be angry, but I will speak again. See, he's persisting in faith. He, he hadn't given up. Suppose there's only 30 to be found there. And the Lord answered, well, I would not do it if I find 30 there. But see, Abraham realizes that God has said he's going to do it. He's going to destroy Sodom. And so he's, he's beginning to say, well, I wonder how many righteous people there really are in Sodom. Um, verse um, 31, and Abraham said, well, behold now, I've taken upon myself to speak again to the Lord. You know what? God wants us to do that. He wants us to take it upon ourselves to speak to him. I mean, if you've got a relationship with somebody and y'all don't ever talk, then, you know, there's a problem there, right? <clears throat> Suppose there's only 20 there. And the Lord replied, well, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. And Abraham's still thinking. He says, well, well, let the Lord not be angry, but I'll speak again. And only this once. Suppose... Ten righteous people shall be found there. And the Lord said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way. And when he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. And he's thinking, okay, now there's Lot, and his wife, and his two daughters, and their husbands. That's six. Is that all the righteous people that there are in Sodom? In fact, it turns out there, there was only one righteous person in Sodom, and, and to call Lot righteous is really kind of a stretch anyway. Go to Genesis chapter 32. That should be an encouragement to us, because if God called Lot righteous, then maybe, you know what, maybe Ray Andrews is righteous. How about that? Uh, Genesis 32, verse 22. Here's another person that persisted in their prayer. Now, one could say, well, you're saying he was praying? He was having a fist fight. Well, that's a metaphor, okay? <clears throat> Some, sometimes we do have to wrestle with God about something. Some, sometimes it's like, like we know that, that God is righteous and we know that we're not where we need to be, but it's like, hey, God, I've got to get free from this thing. And, and you're going to have to help me. And I'm not, I'm not going to quit until you help me. 
And that could be all kinds of things. It could be emotional. It could be uh, a disease. It, it could be a relationship that's gone awry. It could be a lot of stuff. But sometimes we have to, we have to wrestle with God about the thing <clears throat> or just put up with it and live with it. <clears throat> and sometimes you get to a place where you just can't live with it anymore. Well, that was the state here with, uh, with Jacob. And you know what the deal was here? It was a relationship that had gone awry. He was having to meet his brother Esau, with whom there had been sibling rivalry from the get-go. In fact, that's how he got his name, because he was grasping the heel of his twin brother Esau when they were born. And it's like he was finally being confronted with this situation. It's like, Lord, I'm going to have to go meet Esau, and me and him, we just don't jihaw. And this is not going to work. I mean, one of us is going to kill the other one unless you, unless you do something. And you know what? That rivalry has still gone on with their descendants even to this day. So that shows you how bad, how, how vast a thing sibling rivalry can be. And folks, look at, look at the body of Christ now, 2,000 years after Jesus. Look how many different versions of Christianity there are. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, they're, they're all right, and I'm not saying they're all wrong, and I'm not saying we're all right and all the rest of 275,000 of them are wrong. You know, we're wrong too about something. But still, one of the things that drives that, well, two things. There's self-righteousness, and then there's sibling rivalry. That accounts for all the division in the body of Christ. Those two things right there is, you know, your brother offends you, and so you think, well, I'm right, by golly, and they're wrong. And voila, here we are. Here's, here's the state of the body of Christ right now. Esau and Jacob. Okay, anyway, this was the condition when Jacob and Esau were about to meet each other, and so Jacob sends his family over to a safe place, and then he's, he's here talking to God. In verse 22, <clears throat> and uh, Jacob arose that same night and took his two wives, his two women servants, his eleven sons, and passed over the ford of Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the brook, and he sent them over with all that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man, and this is, man is capitalized, so we understand this would be a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. How does, how does he do that? I don't know, but he does it. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Well, see, here's the good news there. Is sometimes if we are at this impasse, if we are at a place, it's like, this just has to be fixed. Well, Jesus takes the initiative to wrestle with us. It's like he shows up and says, are you going to deal with this thing or not? It's like he takes the initiative, right? Well, Jesus took the initiative here. And, and um, he wrestled with him until daybreak. Well, there is, there is a daybreak coming, right? Okay, verse uh, 25. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So, uh, moral of the story there is if you wrestle with Jesus, he's going to win. Just write that down. He's going to win. Okay? And um, he said, hey, let me go. Let's get this thing done because the day is breaking. You know, the day is breaking, folks. You know, that planet Earth is running out of time before Jesus is going to come back. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff that's wrong, and it's all got to get fixed before he comes back. So, so uh, you know, we need to wrestle with him. Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. Well, the blessing was for him to get delivered, see. And so the man asked him, well, what is your name? And in the shock of recognition... Jacob whispered and said, Jacob, which means supplanter, schemer, trickster, and swindler. See, it was a shock of recognition as he uh, examined himself 
and realized he was judged, like it says there in 1 Corinthians. And so Jesus said, well, your name shall no more be called Jacob, but it will be Israel, which means contender with God, for you have contended and had power with God and with men and have prevailed. Okay, you get the point. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Lest you think that the only time that one needs to, uh, to pray under difficult circumstances is when you've really messed up badly, that's not always necessary. That's not necessarily a condition of you wrestling with God. Because Jesus even did that in his earthly ministry. It says it right here, Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> For every high priest chosen among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. And he is able to exercise gentleness and forbearance toward the ignorant and erring since he himself is also liable to moral weakness and physical infirmity. And because of this, he is obliged to offer sacrifices <clears throat> for his own sins as well as for those of the people. In verse 5, So too Christ, the Messiah, did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but he was appointed and exalted by him who said to him, You are my son, Today I have begotten you. <clears throat> well, see, verse 2 tells us uh, about the, the role of intercession. And that is that you're praying for people who are not doing right. You know, this is not praying for blessings necessarily, but, but it's praying for for God's mercy, it's praying for God's forgiveness. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of this. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. <clears throat> now this was during the time... Uh, of the judges, and it says that this was before Israel had a king, and their tendency was, as it says in the last verse in the book of Judges, to do everybody to do what was right in their own eyes. Okay, and in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, when Samuel was old, <clears throat> he made his sons judges over Israel. <clears throat> Verse 3, but his sons did not walk in his ways, but they turned aside after gain and took bribes and perverted justice. And so all of the elders of Israel assembled and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you are old, <clears throat> and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint over us a king to rule over us like all the other nations. Now, let's understand a king. First of all, as it, as it stated here, a king rules. A king has authority. A, a, a king, uh, they, they are uh, the big cheese. Uh, the buck stops with them, as Harry Truman said. Okay, and when there is a time of crisis uh, and people feel insecure, they are looking for a strong leader. Okay, just like America at this point in time, uh, a lot of Americans who've seen the, the deterioration of society over the last uh, 30 years or so uh, were, were really looking for somebody to be president of the United States who, who presents themselves as strong. Well, we got that. Now, and, and the media constantly tries to pull him down and make him look stupid, but it's like, he just stands there like, 
get out of here. Well, it's like that, that appeals to people. But that is not necessarily a good thing. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump here. I mean, it could be, it could be anybody. It could be Joe Blow. I mean, the, the point is not who the person is that's the, 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 the figurehead, the strong leader. The problem is with the people and why they are looking for that. Okay? <clears throat> because, number one, they want it to be like all the other nations. Well, God's people don't need to be like the world. But if in the body of Christ it's like, well, the world does this and that, so we need to do that so we'll look like we've got it all together. Mm, you're going down the wrong road right there. Okay. Verse 6. But it displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to govern us. Now, unless you look in Strong's Concordance, you might, that word, it displeased Samuel, might just kind of slide by. No, it wasn't just that he was unhappy with them asking him that. <clears throat> that the word translated displeased, there's actually two Hebrew words. It means it was evil in his eyes. It looked bad. He looked at that situation that they, they weren't wanting to, to do things where they come to the priest, the prophet, and hear from God, that they were wanting a secular authority to kind of take that place. And Samuel said, hmm, that is, that is wrong. You know, they, that, that, that's the road of Hitler. That's, that's the road of Stalin. That's the road of every dictator. They become God. You know, that was, that was what Caesar was. Caesar was worshipped as God. And that's what the Antichrist is going to be. If there, he's, going to be he's going to present himself as God. See, this is one of the reasons why I know Donald Trump is not the Antichrist, because he doesn't present himself as God. But I'll tell you, some of his followers would probably want to make him that. And that's wrong. Okay? And so Samuel saw this characteristic in Israel and said, mm, this is not good. And so uh, Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, well, hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. See, Samuel was feeling a little rejected. It's like, hey, God, I'm supposed to be representing you. And it's like, they're not even listening to me. And God said, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. For they have rejected me that I should not be king over them. Okay, go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. So Samuel gives them their king, and it's Saul, and that doesn't turn out very well. But anyway, 1 Samuel 12, Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to you and all that you have said to me, and I have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. <clears throat> and then verse 16. So stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? Now this is interesting because wheat harvest is Pentecost. So this was on a, a, a feast day that this conversation between Samuel and Israel was happening. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain and then you shall know and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for a king for yourselves. And so Samuel called to the Lord and he sent thunder and rain that day. And all of the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And they said to Samuel, Well, pray for your servants that the Lord your God, that, and the Lord your God, that, he may, uh, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil in asking for a king. And Samuel said to the people, Fear not. You will indeed not die. <laughs> right? Just like what the doctor said to Steve. You're not going to die. 
Okay? But yet, turn, us, turn not aside from following the Lord and serve Him with all your heart. And turn not aside after vain and worthless things which cannot profit or deliver you, for they are empty and futile. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake. Just like it says in Hebrews 13, God will not leave us or forsake us or relax his hold upon us. But it has pleased him to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. You know, this is something we'll talk about in another message here. Well, I'll, I'll cover it just a little bit today before we quit. But Samuel, you know, they, they, they offended him, really, by, by asking for a king. And, you know, in the natural, a person say, okay, you know, you're done with me? Well, I'm done with you. You know, I ain't going to pray for you anymore. He said, no. He said, that would be a sin. He said, I'm still going to pray for you, even though you've replaced my, the place that, that my office had in your life with this king, I'm still going to pray for you. That he said, I, I will, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider how great are the things that he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. We'll go to Matthew chapter 5. You know, it's easy to pray for some people. It's easy to pray for your loved ones. It's easy to pray for your friends. It's easy to pray for uh, the good people of America. It's, it's easy to, to pray for, uh, you know, the things that, that says, well, pray for, for your leaders that we have... Uh, you know, a peaceful life. There are certain things we want to pray for and that we do regularly. But there are some people and some things we don't want to pray for. That it, it's not easy to pray for them. Just like it wasn't easy for Samuel to pray for the people of Israel in that situation. Well, in Matthew chapter 5, this is what Jesus says about this. He said, You have heard it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 43. Well, that's what people do. Unless your neighbor becomes your enemy. <laughs> but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, I need to read that verse out of the New King James Version because for some reason, the Amplified Translators left some stuff out that the King James has in it. Verse 44 in the New King James Version says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Uh, that covers a lot of grounds there, doesn't it? Okay, well, as you know, that's not an easy thing to do. Verse 45, but it says, when you do this, you show that you are children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the wicked and the good, and he makes the rain fall upon the upright and the wrongdoers alike. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do that? And if you greet only your brethren, what more than others are you doing? Do not even the heathen do that? You, therefore, must be perfect. And I like the way Amplified explains what that word means. It means growing into complete maturity in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity. See, this is like what Ephesians 4 says, what God's purpose is for us to reach spiritual maturity. And he's saying here that praying for those who are not treating you right is a way to do that. Well, it's interesting because 
Go back to Psalm 110. I'll leave you with this. It's interesting to show that praying for those who are not treating you right it is a God thing. Yeah, we, we got to say, God, help me do that, because it's just that's not natural. But look here at Psalm 110. The Lord God says to my Lord Jesus Christ, sit at my right hand. See, he's our high priest sitting at the right hand of God until I make your adversaries your footstool. That means you're going to be showed to be the one that's right and they're going to be showed to be the one that's wrong. You see that? It means you're above them. They're, they're, they don't win. They don't beat you. You, you win but it says, the Lord will send forth from Zion the scepter of your strength. Well, you know, I had never seen that praying for my enemies is part of the scepter of my strength. Because when you do that, you are taking the superior position. You are taking the high road. Right? The Lord will send forth from Zion the scepter of your strength. Rule then in the midst of your enemies. See, that, that's ruling in the midst of your enemies when they're doing wrong and you're praying for them. That's ruling. That means you're the one that's in the high position and they're the one that's in the low position. And in verse 3 it says, and your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your power. The Lord, make us willing. And in the beauty of holiness and in holy array, out of the womb of the morning shall spring forth to you your young men who are as the dew. And this is how I know that it's talking about prayer here, that, that prayer applies here in the 110th Psalm. He says, For the Lord has sworn and will not revoke or change it. You are a priest forever. Just like Jesus. Just like Samuel. Just like Abraham. But see, Abraham even rec had to recognize a higher authority, and that was Melchizedek. And we won't go back into Genesis to see that whole uh, story there. So Lord, teach us how to rule with prayer in the midst of our enemies. And as we see the, the proliferation of iniquity in this world, the, the rising tide of lawlessness, and, and we see the, the rising hostility against your people, Father, we, we recognize that we have an assignment as watchmen, that we should not hide our eyes from that and just, just uh, you know, only focus on the Pollyanna positive, but that we should, should deal head on with those things by prayer, and that we should not have a heart of vengeance, but we should have a heart of mercy. So do this in us, Father, that we can come to that place of spiritual maturity that is your intention, that is nothing less than the standard height of Jesus Christ and the perfection found in him, in Jesus' name. Amen.